Economics, organized by the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Uh, today, is, today uh, one of the masterminds of economic theory is going to give us a lecture. He is particularly well known in his work uh, in the theory of the firm. Uh, what are the boundaries of the firms? Uh, what incentive structures should we have within or outside the firms? Uh, or why do we have the firms in the first place? Um, so he has had also great contributions to other related <coughs> fields such as corporate finance, global uh, economics, especially the bankruptcy procedures and that kind of stuff. Um, today, I guess he's going to present his uh, uh, innovative idea of building contracts as reference points, uh, which is something uh, he started working on in, in the late years, uh, particularly in a paper with his long-time co-author, uh, Professor John Moore of Edinburgh. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure and honor to present Andrew Fuhrer, Professor of Economics at Harvard University. Oliver Well, thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction, Aaron. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so, uh, when Aaron first asked me to uh, speak, I gave him a couple of possible topics. Um, of course, if I'd known what was going to be happening to the world, I probably would have suggested uh, subprime mortgages and uh, financial meltdown. Uh, although that would have been a shorter lecture, probably about 15 minutes. But, uh, um, instead, I'm afraid I'm going to stick to something a little more academic, which is closer to. I, I do have views about the financial crisis, but um, this is this is something I know more about. What I'm going to be talking about, uh, which is, uh, as Eric said, uh, 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 subtle. What I'm going to be talking about is based on um, uh, a lecture I gave at the London School of Economics in 2007. It was actually an inaugural Ronald Coe's lecture, uh, which was later published in the Economic uh, in August 2008. And as um, some of you will know, uh, Ronald Coe's um, was an undergraduate at the London School of Economics, uh, and he wrote he published his famous 1937 article on the theory of the while he was um, a faculty member at the London School of Economics. But, uh, even, more, uh, that, uh, but he, even more surprising uh, is the fact that he actually conceived of the article. Uh, so it was published in 37. He really had the ideas in the early 30s when he was still an undergraduate at LSE, but he was a little slow in actually getting uh, into it. <laughs> Well, given that sort of uh, history, I was um, very proud uh, and honored to be asked to give um, the inaugural lecture. Um, I don't know whether Coase, Coase is still alive, you see, he's, he's pretty old in his late 90s. I don't know whether he uh, is aware that I gave it. Um, if so, I doubt that he would feel any great honor that I was giving the lecture. I, uh, I don't think he, he has a particular interest in the kind of work I do, uh, even though I followed in his footsteps, um, because he doesn't uh, put much weight on formal theory. I think he thinks it's a waste of time. Um, I, I met Coase a few times in the mid-80s to mid-90s, and I remember, I think it was the sort of second occasion I met him, um, it was at a conference at the University of Rochester, and I was giving um, theory of the firm paper, and um, I was very surprised to see him in the audience, and he was there for the conference, but this was only just before the conference, so I didn't expect him to be there, but there he was, listening to my paper, and I was, I was very interested to hear afterwards what the great man thought about what I was doing, and he came up to me and he said, um, if I'd known as much mathematics as you, I think I would have become a chemist. <laughs> So uh, I thought about that many times, and, I, and there's no way I can interpret it as a, as a compliment. <laughs> anyway, I, I carried, or I didn't uh, go to chemistry, uh, and I say, say this so, um, I gave a slightly 
lecture. Anyway, let's, uh, the lecture is um, divided into two parts. Uh, the first part talks about uh, a little bit of the history of the theory of the firm, starting with Coase's work. Um, and what I argue in that part is that uh, it's been hard to make progress on, on the Coasean agenda. Then in the second part, I talk about some recent work that I've been doing, which uh, I think may push things along a bit. But that is, of course, very recent and therefore much more speculative. So let me start with part one, this uh, famous 1937 paper and what followed. And by the way, I'm not really sure uh, I may end you know, well before the time. I usually don't, because somehow I'm more verbose than I think I am. But at least in principle, uh, I'm not quite sure how long this lecture uh, takes. And it's about four. We will see. Um, OK, so in this 37 paper, Coase first raised the question of why we have firms at all in a modern market economy. Now, it seems an astonishing thing that um, this question was raised in 1937. Why so late? And I, I, we don't really have a good answer to that. The fact is that economists uh, spend a lot of time, did before then, and still do, spend a lot of time thinking about markets and trade between um, individuals and individual firms. Um, they don't really think much about what goes on inside the firm. And in fact, as you all know, in, in standard, uh, in basic economic texts, the, the firm is Um, and Coase really said, well, this isn't good enough. Um, presumably, I mean, there's a lot of activity going on inside firms in the world, and we need to understand it because it's, it's surely economically based. Um, and the first question is, you know, why is there so much of this stuff going on in firms as opposed to in markets, which we think are, are so good? But Coase also recognized that any satisfactory theory uh, has also got to um, answer the converse question, which is um, we, we, all, we don't see everything taking place in a, one giant firm either. You know, clearly, markets are used a lot, so they must be good, but they're not perfect, because if they were, we wouldn't see firms. But firms can't be perfect, because if they were, we wouldn't see markets. So to quote uh, another British economist, D.H. Robinson, uh, he said, I think, uh, rather, um, it's a rather fine um, phrase. He said, uh, we find islands of, so these are firm, islands of conscious power in this ocean of unconscious cooperation, like lumps of butter coagulating in a pail of buttermilk. I don't know where, how, how one would translate that into Turkish. Uh, it also, it always makes me feel slightly nauseated. But it's, uh, when I read that, but it is uh, sort of fine English, I think. Anyway, um, okay, so I don't think, you know, Adam Smith talked about the band of the firm. He talked about many things, but for some reason, he didn't talk about that. Maybe that doesn't matter, maybe he was on to something, and, and we shouldn't be wasting our time, but I hope that's not true. Anyway, here are some facts to show that the question Coase was interested in 1937 is still uh, highly relevant today. So in February 2007, there were 41 companies in the world with a market value of equity greater than $100 billion. Now, presumably, it would be less now, but still probably quite sizable. Uh, Walmart, the largest US employer, uh, has, or had in 2007, <coughs> 1.8 million employees. Um, Here's a table showing employee weighted average sizes of firms. So what this means is, uh, take a typical employee and ask how many other people are working with that person in the same firm. That's basically what this, these numbers are. And what we see is, um, so we have it for two years in various um, European countries, um, 1988, 2001. We see that there's quite a range with Italy in 2001 being at 296, and uh, the UK in uh, 2001 being at 935. But the point
point is these numbers are fairly large, which means that a lot of people are working in uh, pretty large firms. Um, another fact is, which is not on this uh, slide, is that uh, it's been estimated that the uh, value of transactions inside firms in the US is approximately <coughs> the same as the value of transactions outside firms, between firms. So each is about 50%. Um, two thirds of the growth in industries over the 1980s came from growth in the size of existing firms. Um, the boundaries of firms keep changing. Um, the worldwide value of mergers and acquisitions in 2006 exceeded $4 trillion. Well, what this is meant to show is that there's a lot of stuff going on inside firms, um, and there's also a lot of stuff not, and, and the boundaries um, are, are in flux. Okay, so what did Coase have to say about why we see firms at all? You know, again, just to emphasize, since there's so much going on inside firms, that surely as economists we must have something to say about why these um, entities exist. Uh, his answer was that markets are costly. So, you know, there are costs of using the market. And he focused particularly on um, discovering what the relevant prices are. So this is one cost, you know, uh, in contrast to the standard uh, generally Gliman model where we assume or everybody knows what the relative prices um, are. He, he had in mind something, something different where you actually have to learn what the relevant and then he also talked about uh, the cost of negotiating a contract for each exchange transaction. Now, uh, economists since Coase have referred to these as haggling costs. Uh, I don't think you can find that term in Coase's original article, but anyway, it's sort of the term people use. Um, one might say, um, one might use the term argument costs in the case of a contract negotiation we're arguing about. But maybe haggling is fine. Now, Coase's view was that these haggling costs are avoided inside a firm because inside a firm you don't have bargaining. Bargaining is replaced by authority. Uh, an employer tells an employee what to do, and within limits, the employee um, obeys. So that, for Coase, was the benefit of doing things inside the firms. You don't have to haggle. Instead, instead I just tell you.